Thank you, Dr. Frank. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I was at the Karolinska, I think maybe 15 years ago, probably. We quite haven't figured out which exact date it was because I can't remember. I'm losing some brain cells. Um, and unfortunately, aging is, has hit in a big way. Um, and hence the need to think about recovery in the brain. <laughs> but, um, but it was a pleasure then, and I was here because I was um, involved in dialectical behavior therapy and some training with that, and have not presented in this forum. And so it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I thank you for inviting me, and uh, have had some great uh, couple of days meeting with, uh, with several of you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the stressed brain. Uh, which is, which is um, I, I think, a little bit more novel in the concept of, of stress because stress research, of course, has been around for a long time. Um, stress effects on chronic disease and on health has been known for a long time. A lot of that work has focused on we get stressed and what happens in our body. And so what I would like to talk about today is we get stressed and what happens in our brains first. Um, I hope to show you that, in fact, the brain is the first and the primary target of stress. And because of novel tools and technologies, we are now able to explore that level of, of uh, problems or dysfunction or um, pathology that begins uh, there. And we've now been able to do this for, for uh, over a decade, uh, but I think the, the tools are getting more and more refined. Um, so I hope to talk about stress broadly, uh, its impact on chronic illnesses and disease uh, globally, but then really start to talk about definitions, the types, what type of stress is not good. When you talk about stress, you have to think about childhood stress or starting early because that's where stress pathways are developing um, and then how it relates to physical and mental health disorders. Uh, the neurobiology of stress, and this will be, uh, you tell me if I can translate this down to all of us being able to understand and capturing it. So that's, uh, that's a fun thing for me to do. It's effects on cognition and emotion, and then it's effects on behavior and health. And then something close to my heart, because of aging and because of other things, uh, including the practice of, um, of um, um, clinical interventions, how do we change this? And can we change it? Or are we stuck? with the consequences of stress. So that's, that's hopefully what I would like to cover. Um, now, in the US, for several years now, since 2005, the American Psychological Association has been conducting surveys yearly to assess what, how are people feeling, how much stress is out there. And you can see from there, at least in the US, that over more than half of people are feeling pretty stressed. They'll just report being stressed or very stressed, including over a third of ado adolescents and children. Um, this is, as I said, being assessed yearly. And then it goes on. So close to 43% report, so very close to half, will report that they have had two or more adverse childhood experiences. And those are the ones listed, and we'll come back to that. About seven items, which even the US Centers for Disease Control are now um, measuring yearly in the population. Um, almost half of U.S. men and women have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner, which is a form of stress, clearly, uh, in their lifetime. And then the prevalence of anxiety disorders, which, as you know, globally is uh, close to a third of individuals in the population. So these are direct stress-related uh, impact and effects that people are talking about. It is no longer maybe a small portion of the population that is being affected and repeatedly being affected. So no matter which disorder and chronic illness we are struggling with, it's important to think about this environmental factor. It may or may not be causally related, but it likely is having an impact on the disease that you're studying. And indeed, data show that stress increases the risk of developing these illnesses, chronic illnesses, and the risk of relapse, so you might contain somebody's uh, symptoms in each of these illnesses. They might improve what predicts relapse. All of these are disorders that, in fact, come back and can repeatedly come back. And so risk of relapse is a huge treatment challenge for us. And as you can see here, 
There's um, mood and anxiety disorders, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. There's addictive disorders. I have a question mark next to food because of the food addiction debate that is going on globally. And then there are chronic medical conditions and diseases related to both sets of psychiatric disorders, which we like to at least um, want to consider them um, together. So stress is clearly a factor in these. When you think about healthcare costs, which in the US, they're really uh, growing and have been, have been breaking the back, so to speak, in terms of the uh, financial state of the country, and I think even globally, uh, perhaps in Sweden as well. I don't know the numbers as well. Uh, but if you look at, and this is a great paper that actually looked, at, plotted the total expenditures, healthcare expenditures, in the first graph here on the left, um, and you see people who had severe psychological distress. Now, it could have been related to their health condition, and that's okay. We'll talk about definitions in a minute. Um, so you have the severe group in red and the moderate uh, psychological distress in blue and then the no low psychological distress in green. And in each case, total expenditures in the U.S., outpatient office-based uh, expenditures, outpatient office-based visits. Higher psychological distress is carrying the bulk of expenditures. And once again, this is a factor that is sort of cutting across illnesses and one that perhaps we are not paying as much attention to because we are faced with the acute treatment of the illness that you are um, treating um, as in the clinic. Let's look at globally. This is data from the World Health Organization, and this is true for all uh, highly developed countries, and I think Sweden uh, would be in that category. Neuropsychiatric disorders and global disease burden. So of course, with our disorders in mental health, people don't die unless, of course, it's suicide, and those rates are increasing. But the disease burden is heavy. And when you look at this, in gray here, right here, is neuropsychiatric disorders. This is data from 2004. The World Health Organization has now projected these data out to 2030. These numbers have gone up in their projections exorbitantly. Okay, eating the day or capturing the day there in the neuropsychiatric disorders is unipolar depression and addiction substance abuse disorders, and then the others in terms of global disease burden. And it's way more than any of these others. Um, so this is, some, this is a very uh, cautionary note and one that is sobering because these numbers are going up. They are not going down. In their projections to 2030, they are going up. When you look then at the leading causes of burden of disease, and here, the WHO actually compared the 2004 directly to 2030. We were with depressive disorders, a direct uh, illness related to stress, was number three here in 2004, moved up in 2030. Depressive disorders, as we all know, of course, are highly prevalent on their own, but very much so comorbid with several of the conditions that I had listed earlier as stress-related illnesses. Um, and so you see that the burden is increasing. This is sobering and this is something that has, uh, that has made me sort of take pause and say, if I want to do something that can affect healthcare, what should I be doing? I have a few years left or maybe some years left um, and it has led me to sort of uh, think about causal mechanisms or, or uh, factors that cut across illnesses that we are all treating. And I just want to talk a little bit about the caveat of gene-environment interactions. Most of my talk is going to be about stress and about the environment. And I want to acknowledge that on purpose I'm not talking about the gene-environment interactions. That can be a separate talk. Indeed, stress's effects are going to be, there are individual differences, and they're going to be in interactions with genes and with gene expression and with epigenetic changes. And indeed, you have stress and adversity that interacts with genetic predisposition, as well as lifestyle factors and other kinds of exposures that can lead to uh, changes in reactivity and changes in, in um, our sort of internal resources of what we have, our capacities, and what we have to handle and deal with stress and um, ward off illnesses um, of different kinds. So that's very much a nod to that, uh, but I would be happy to discuss that more 
um, uh, as, as the discussion grows. So what is stress? It's the most talked about word on the web. If you type stress on the internet, you get about 30 million hits. Everything about the meaning, about how it doesn't exist, about its hogwash, about how to reduce stress, how to solve the problem of stress, uh, all of that comes up. Um, and so we're scientists, right? So we need to figure out what is it, how are we going to try to understand this, scientists and clinicians. Um, so there's all kinds of stressors. Work stress, financial stress, parenting stress, relationship stress, family stress, physical health related stressors. These are all the major categories. If you ask all of these surveys that are done, people say, well, what is stressing you out? These are the things that top the day, so to speak. There's life event stress, hurricanes, tsunamis. Those would be life event stress, un totally unpredictable and uncontrollable. And so we're left again with challenge of what is stress. And then very much so, I want to put a caveat on emotions and stress. Um, because a lot of how we translate emotions and then um, deal with stressors are tied to our management of emotions. And we know from beautiful work done by Ekman and others that there are basic emotions that are hardwired in the brain. There are emotional circuits that are hardwired. How does this connect to stress? We were very interested in that. And one of the things we found over the years in sampling people and surveying the folks we study, because we also get their uh, emotional ratings when we provoke stress in the laboratory, and you'll see some of that. These are sort of the culprits that are related to emotional stress. Emotional stress goes up when you have sand, sadness, anger, and fear. And the more these emotions come up together, the more they're likely to generate secondary emotions like guilt and shame and those other things that patients talk about. But at the, oops, mm, going backwards, no. Thank you. Um, I'm not using this, right? Okay, there we go. Um, but at the bottom of it all, in terms of the primary circuitry, we've got these three that, that do tend to go up and start to um, increase the feeling of it becoming uncontrollable. The, that the emotions move on to stress and it's the feeling of uh, becoming uncontrollable. So where's the, what's the definition? You saw this flicker and here it is. Uh, so we can struggle with, with thinking about stress and saying, well, you know, the policeman stopped me. I was driving too fast. I don't know if that was so stressful or not. Your stressor was this and mine was that. I could cope with it. You couldn't cope with it. And that's where everybody, we can get stuck in the debate over the definition and the types. And yet, I've shown you, I hope, a little bit of data to say that it's too important a factor to get us as scientists, as clinical scientists and basic scientists, stuck on operationalizing it and not being able to look, study it. And to study it, we need to be able to define it. So here is what we've done. We've basically defined, started at the extreme side, which is challenging, threatening, overwhelming, uncontrollable events. Okay, so an event that has these four, um, these, um, four um, qualities unpredictable, uncontrollable, overwhelming, challenging. And I hope to show you that when we talk about those uh, factors or those qualities, components of stress, you get to uncontrollable events. You get to really bad events that in fact have its impact on uh, health-related illnesses. So rather than worrying about, well, some things I can handle, some I can't, how will you manage, is it really stressful? Start with things that are clearly stressful. You lose someone that's important to you, that is stressful. You're part of a violent act, that is stressful. That is uncontrollable, that is unpredictable. Absolutely there's an effect of that. How about we start there, we look at what happens with that, how is that impacting the person, and how does that translate into increased risk for illness. So that would be the definition. Of course, we know that a stress has effects immediately because of our uh, need as humans and as mammals to adapt and survive. There are signals that go uh, get um, generated right away. And how many of us have felt stressed and, and your heart beating faster? 
right? Sweaty palms, tightness in your stomach, butterflies. And I say this, this is sort of the, the very natural stress reaction. And yet, if I sampled right now, some of you would say, oh, I feel it more in my heart. Some would say, I feel it in my, in my stomach. Oh, no, I feel the tension right away. So there is this right there, you start to see some individual variation, which is fantastic. It's a great thing, and I hope to talk about that a little bit later. But it's important to just give a nod to it. This is the first way that we start to perceive something may be wrong. Sensations, expressions, and actions, facial expressions. If I stood here and Dr. Frank had said something, and I'm, and I'm doing this, all of you would start to notice something's up with her. She looks a little stressed, a little tense. She didn't like what Dr. Frank said. We're assessing those things right away. My bodily posture and expressions, whoops, are already, are already giving you uh, signs and signals of how I'm feeling. So emotions and stressors are communicative in its signaling process. They want to tell you, the other person, this person is under distress. Do something about it. If I'm just frowning, there's not much to be done, except I probably will lose your attention very quickly. Uh, but other than that, it's a very important mode in which we communicate uh, emotions. And then, of course, hormones, the fight or flight response, the adrenaline flowing, we know about that. Uh, so I want to just acknowledge that, that that's a very key component by which we signal the body to get ready to stress and then also signal the brain to start to do the work of adaptation and normalize stress. And this, of course, includes the immune responses as well. OK, so stress, of course, is crucial for adaptation. I've just been telling you how bad it could be. And yet, it's one of the best ways that we learn. If you saw something that caused you pain, your brain will remember that for the rest of your life. It is the crucial way that we learn. So it is our system for adaptation and for survival. And in fact, if many of you have been part of a project where you were really stressed out, there was perhaps a deadline, 5 o'clock deadline today, and you had to get your project done, right? Everybody was working together. The team was working together. There's actually increased energy. There's in focused attention. These are good things. This is not the bad stuff I'm talking about, right? There's in improved working memory. There's improved cognitive ability, some enhanced performance. Everybody's charged up. You're going to deliver that project at 5 PM, right? So these are mild to moderate levels of, of stress. You're actually going to get there. Now, what if I just said, guess what? Your deadline has just passed. It was actually 3 PM. You read it wrong. What's going to happen then? All of this is going to get out the window. Meanwhile, while it is still 5 PM and things are going well, your body is signaling. And these are just all of the changes that start to happen, which many of you are familiar with. But your body is letting the adrenal cortex know there's uh, jazzing up of the norepinephrine and epinephrine and cortisol. And more importantly, the prefrontal cortex is alive. Yellow and red means activated, overactivated. And so it is actually in overdrive trying to deliver on that project that has that 5 PM deadline. right? So this is crucial for adaptation. Next time you have that deadline, you'd probably do prepare for it differently. So you've actually learned and enacted behaviors that are going to help you the next time, and you probably won't be even as stressed. And what is the system that is doing that very well? We as humans have the most advanced prefrontal cortex, and we're going to start talking about the brain. And I'm going to have each of you do the brain in your hands in a minute. But really, before we talk about the brain, there are abilities that we just develop over time, right? Cognitive abilities, planning, problem solving, reasoning, abstraction. These are cognitive abilities, but how can we have them? We actually have them so that we can think through things and improve our ways of coping and, and maybe solving our problems and adapting in the environment so that we can survive. And this, these are functions that are being done by the prefrontal cortex. It's, it's central to regulating emotions. We talk about it being central for cognitive abilities. But indeed, it's, cel it's central for regulating emotions. And I hope to show that. And how many times have we sat and perhaps watched a TV show when you have a deadline the next day? 
eh, maybe I'll get it done a little bit later. A little distraction, a little procrastination, right? We use those kinds of not so effective, not so effective strategies as well. So the brain knows how to do that too. Um, and then, of course, we talked a little bit about the biology, the autonomic and stress hormone mo mobilization, which is very important for adaptation, and then behaviors. How many of you have actually taken a walk when you're really stressed out and you can't quite figure out what to do? How does that feel when you take a walk? You just leave it and go out for a little walk. Five minutes, ten minutes. Feels better, right? A little bit. So there's a behavioral adaptation. There's a behavioral coping that we know how to do. So we can run from dangerous situations. That happens very quickly. We can exercise. You can take a walk, regular sleep. All of those are positive um, behavioral coping or positive behavioral adaptation. And then there are th other things we do, like that project just finished at 5 PM. Let's go have a drink. Po can be positive. If you go past four or five drinks in one sitting, not so good. The body can't handle it that well. So bad hab habits tend to get uh, set more. And we'll talk a little bit about how that starts to happen. So the brain's regulation of stress and behavior, which is where, what this was leading up to, and the idea of what the prefrontal <laughs> cortex does. So we're going to do uh, the brain in your hands, OK? Brain 101. So my, one of the goals, I would hope, is that you walk out of here. Some of you may be neuroscientists, and you already know this. But if you're not, you're going to actually have the brain in your hands. All right? So I would like everybody to put up your dominant hand and make a fist, literally like this. OK. And give me some latitude. I'm going to actually put, superimpose this hand on this model. And you can tell me by nodding if I'm close enough, OK? So I'm going to do this. You think I'm close enough? This thing over here is kind of like my fist. And this thing coming down is like my arm coming down. Do you buy that? Maybe? OK. So that part is right there in the middle. And then coming down, going down into your spinal cord. Right there is your fist. OK. I want you to remember this is the bottom part of your brain. OK. The more primitive part of your brain. Right here, there are some organs or, or some li little structures called amygdala and what we call the ventral striatum and the dorsal striatum, things that are important in emotion and in signaling reward. That's all in here. But there are also the hypothalamus sort of on the bottom here, which is important for regulating emotions, but also provoking them, signaling the rest of the body for emotions. And that's down here, right there sending signals to the, to the rest of the body through the spinal cord. So you've got your brain, one part of the brain, with the fist. Now I want, with your other hand, give it a cap. OK? Right there. And with your fingers and the top part, that's your cortex, right there. And this is the brain in your hand, OK? Hopefully, by the time you get out of here, you will feel like you have the brain in your hands. This is your primitive brain. Very important. People call it the primitive brain, but it's actually really, really critical. If we didn't have that, we would not be living the, the long ages that we do. But the cortex helps us with regulating emotions. And a lot of what we do in development from age pre-zero right through the early 20s is refining the talk between these two components, between your cap and the fist. And you're going back and forth. Now here's where the rubber hits the road, or the clincher, as we call it, which is that this is the part that gives us beautiful cognitive abilities that are unique to humans, reasoning, abstraction, foresight, wisdom. But those are learned skills. And when we get overloaded, it's a finite capacity. It starts to droop down. Emotional overloading or cognitive overloading. So that's when your brain in your hand starts to not be balanced and the cap is slumping down. OK, so you'll remember that hopefully when, when you think about the brain in your hands. When you're not stressed, this is what the prefrontal cortex is doing. Your cap is charged up. It's regulating attention. 
It's inhibiting appropriate responses. If you're really angry at somebody, how come you don't slap them? Your prefrontal cortex is saying, nah, not a good idea. Somebody's going to get upset. You might start a fight. It's not the thing we do. What did my mother teach us? All of that right here. Inhibiting appropriate responses, regulating um, emotions, regu regulating the viscera, the rest of the body as well. Um, Am I hungry? Am I not hungry? All of that is getting coordinated through here when we are not stressed. And what happens under stress? So perhaps when you have that project, it's, not, it's going well. It's, you don't start to see atrophy. But over time, what we know from basic science research is that the prefrontal cortex starts to droop. There's a little bit of atrophy, and I'll talk about what I mean by atrophy. And that starts to leave the fist a little bit loose. It's going. It's telling. It's sending out these signals. There's a lot of reactivity. I want this. I want that. What's helped me feel better? I'm going to go ahead with that. So there's overreactivity over here. There's physiologic dysregulation, and the control systems are drooping, are down. Okay. So that's the model I'm putting in fourth in front of you. You don't have to buy it yet. Hopefully I will show you some data that will convince you perhaps a little bit. And extending that model, we, we thought that really this process probably starts early in development. Even though the prefrontal cortices, those cortical areas, the part about the cap is still growing. In fact, if you have the right sort of healthy cortical development, this er these areas grow well and they're able to control behaviors and the body, as well as your emotions. And you have adaptive behavioral control developing, regulated hedonic drive, so you can control reward well. And you can control your intake of the rewarding substances and, and things. And you have better health or good health. Whereas in the high stress conditions, perhaps you have disrupted cortical limbic. So disrupted cap and fist coordination, development, connections. And under that disruption, you have discontrol, um, impaired behavioral control, dysregulated hedonic drives, and then the vulnerability for chronic diseases. So here's a model that Hilary Blumberg, Linda Mays, and myself have put forth uh, several years ago and have been testing it. And in fact, when we look at, um, at data that I will show you in a minute, you will see how it actually maps onto that. Before we go there, let's just take a minute and think about the childhood uh, adversities that are very common. So here are the types of childhood exposures that have been measured very clearly. Substance abuse in the household, witnessing domestic violence, family member in prison, mental illness in the household, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse. I hope that I've made the point that there are stressors like these that there is no question about whether that's a stressor that's uncontrollable or not. And right there, when you have those which have been measured by the Centers for Disease Control every year um, since 1998, and then also uh, other data, we see the, the prevalence of people endorsing those different types of childhood adversities um, in the US. And in fact, when you collapse those together, you see these are different populations in blue and, and red, but one was collected in 1998, the other in 2009. And this very sort of intriguing drop in children who did not have any adversities, and these are adults reporting ret retrospectively, but nonetheless, that there's a drop there and there's an increase in four or more. Again, not the same population, so very much under caveat there, but very intriguing and perhaps worrisome as a trend. And of course, on the x-axis here is number of adverse childhood exposures. When you look at that and the odds of having these various um, chronic illnesses, including depression, and I could put alcoholism on here and it would follow very closely to the depression line, uh, essentially you have an increase with an increase in the number of adverse childhood exposures. So here's some of the data that I was showing you about, the, that I was referring to about the model in development. So these are data uh, l from Hillary Blumberg's lab, our collaboration together in most cases. And I'm going to go slowly here to just because it's a busy slide. 
but on your top left hand corner, the first row are uh, comparisons between high childhood stress and low childhood stress in adolescence. These are brains of children between the ages of 12 and 17. And what we see here is lower, whoops, lower prefrontal gray matter volume. So an area in the prefrontal cortex is just lower in volume. We'll talk more about volume in a minute. Um, and that is inversely associated with child maltreatment or childhood adversity. Okay, so higher your level of childhood adversity, lower volume right there. And inverse association with cortisol, higher cortisol, lower response. This is brain activation in the middle uh, brain slice there. Again, in the prefrontal cortex. Function, lower prefrontal cortex, I'm sorry, higher childhood trauma uh, scores here associated with more errors on executive control, a factor that is um, being processed in the prefrontal cortex. This is repeat data, sex-related repeat data of brains of people with child maltreatment, children with child maltreatment, repeated over one year. And you see prefrontal cortex reductions in volume not improving. If you've had high childhood maltreatment, the volume continues to go down. So this is disturbing to us. Again, early data, we're trying to put it together. Association between response to emotional faces, this time in the hippocampus here, and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and you have a, a negative association there um, between the response in the brain in those regions to faces and childhood maltreatment. And then finally, data again with Linda Mays and Mark Potenza and myself, that uh, lower volume in the frontal cortex predicts future initiation of substance use behaviors. Okay, so that's all childhood data. And this is just to underscore the point that higher childhood trauma scores are associated with more errors, okay, on frontal-based executive function in both cases. So paralleling the childhood data that I just showed you are just new um, data coming out of even experimental exposure to stress. So these are well-controlled experiments where you expose one group to stress and the other group to uh, control condition or the same group, once to stress and the other time to no stress. And what people are finding are experimental stress impairs attention and sustained attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, and goal-directed behavior. Under high levels of stress, the keeping track of your goals goes out the window, and habit-based responding goes up. Beautiful work done by all of these uh, colleagues. And these are recent papers, very well-controlled studies. So if the stress levels are high enough, if they're uncontrollable enough, you start to see this effect. If they are low, you'll actually see improvement. Just like I said earlier, you'll see improvement in functioning. Finally, increased impulsive choice and risk-taking as well. So what about when stress piles up, which is that we don't just get exposed to acute stress in the laboratory. We actually have different stress life events, stressful life events and different uh, experiences. And there's very good animal data that shows that early stressors, just like I was showing you the childhood stress, actually starts to shape the stress pathways, those biological stress pathways that we need for adaptation and for good coping and to get good communication between your fist and, and the cap. Um, so in fact, our question was, can we begin to quantify this and objectively study stress load, if you will? Each of us probably have a stress load based on our life experiences. And so we wanted to see if we can actually quantify that and we've used this uh, cumulative adversity interview takes 20 minutes um, to do or take a little bit longer. It comes from R.J. Turner, who's a um, medical and social epidemiologist, who's done quite a bit of work uh, with this instrument and its association predicting uh, psychiatric illnesses. These are the subscales. And I want you to read the different uh, types of events. 
What's really interesting about this questionnaire, this interview, is that the, there's no, often there is no question about how stressful these events are. Abandonment, divorce and separation, loss of ch child, losing your own child, parental substance <coughs> abuse, relationship difficulties, life traumas, losing home, witnessing or being in an accident, violence situations, sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, being shot, assaulted, tortured, being in combat, losing someone to violence. These are, unfortunately, in the world that we live today, these are not uncommon events. And then recent life events, accidents, illnesses, loss of child again, same overlap here, but in this case, in the past 12 months, in this case, it could have happened before, uh, trouble with the law, pregnancies, abortions, miscarriages, school dropout, financial crises, and so on. All three sets of subscales are events that have occurred. So I would be interviewing you. You would tell me that you actually had this event. You'd tell me the age it happened and how often it's happened the number of times So to get a quantify loading. But I'm not asking you how did you feel about it yet. Okay. The last subscale is a chronic stress. How stressed did you feel? The degree of being overwhelmed. So this is where we pull in for your subjective perception of distress kind of like with the perceived stress scale. But there are three here, sets here, that are really just that they occur or not. And people, by the way, even though this is retrospective, are, um, we have looked at in a sample of 900 people, community adults, um, our um, reliability estimates and inter-item consistency estimates are above 0.9 in some cases. And 0.8, people don't forget bad things that have happened to them. And again, there's no reason for them to make something like that up. OK, so these are the subscales. Now I just want to take you through to some animal data. Can you see that with the light? What you're looking at here is one neuron in the prefrontal cortex, a control neuron from control animals. These are basic science e experiments where the control animals were not stressed, but they were in the same environment, and they were often yoked to the animals that ha were then stressed and repeatedly stressed. Can you see the difference between those two neurons? Anybody want to shout out what's going on here? In yellow there is the, is the cell of the neuron. And this, if, if these little lines from the cell were like branches or dendrites, right? They're kind of falling off. They've gotten shorter. Right? Some, some of them have just gone off um, and disappeared. Synapses are retracting. Dendrites are falling off. With repeated stress, this is happening to one neuron. We have millions of them in our brains, right? And in the prefrontal cortex. So what do you think is happening to millions together? What's happening to the brain? If this is happening to one neuron and things are falling off and kind of getting stubby, what's happening? What would you expect in humans through neuroimaging? Perhaps some reduction in volume, reduction in some shrinkage. And through neuroimaging now, we can image the brain volume. And by quantifying the cumulative stress load of our community adults, these are not psychiatric patients. They don't have a history of psychiatric illness. We find in parallel to the basic science data. What you're seeing on, the, on your right are basically the yellow blobs, and that's not any, you're, you're not seeing any reduction there. All that's saying is, this is the hot spot. This is where there is a lower volume, okay? So this is an association map on the right that you're looking at, which is higher cumulative adversity, greater repeated stress in your life, lower volume, and not all over the brain, but where is it? Is it in your fist or your cap? Cap, right? So who, which part of the brain is taking a hit? Your cap is taking your first big hit. There are also regions like the insula, which is very important in sensing um, the feelings and, and your body's response to stresses, and the striatum, which is reward. And here's the association. So you can see cumulative stress on the x-axis there, and volume here, um, ROI of the prefrontal cortex, and you see that negative association. So of course, we can do association studies. We can also randomize and do a, a controlled study, which we're starting to do pre and post with interventions. But this was 
uh, a direct sort of parallel, so to speak, to animal studies that in fact we can deduct lower volume, higher um, cumulative adversity. Okay, what about function? What about stress response? So if we stress somebody in the scanner and we look at the brain's response to stress, the usual culprits, what you're, see what you're seeing here um, is in the middle would be your fist, everything in the middle, and everything on the top would be your cap. And what you're seeing here is the more cumulative adversity, the more repeated stress you've had in your life, the greater the reactivity in all of those yellow blobs, meaning higher response. And that's what is shown in the bottom row, okay, for target regions. The striatum, again, reward regions, amygdala hippocampus, traditional emotional regions, the lateral PFC, uh, d experiencing stress in the prefrontal cortex, and you see um, a direct association between higher reward, hi higher adversity, and greater reactivity. And we interpreted this as greater sensitization of the stress pathways. Okay. And when you then look at the high group versus the low group, we took the, the highest third and the lowest third, you also see deactivation in the prefrontal cortex, in the cap. So in fact, the cap is start drooping down and not functioning very well when they're experiencing stress, right? So just when you need the cap and you need your cognitive and emotional uh, regulatory regions to be functioning well, in fact, it's down, it's not working very well, and the fist and everything in yellow there that's part of the fist is starting to react up and reacting more so. And we had the Cornell Medical Index uh, completed by, patient, by the subjects, and they told us whether they were having physical and mental health kinds of symptoms, like I'm feeling more anxiety, I'm feeling some sadness. Again, nobody was meeting criteria for any, um, for any illness. What you see is, is lower the medial OFC or the prefrontal regions of the brain that are involved in regulation, greater symptoms, physical and health symptoms, uh, higher hippocampal reactivity, uh, greater the symptoms. And in fact, those regions are connected in a, in a regulatory manner, meaning if you can have greater frontal region, orbital frontal region uh, activation, it inhibits the hippocampus or it, it regulates it and uh, it's associated with less, uh, less physical and mental health symptoms. So we put forth, based on these data and others, that you can go from stress that is manageable, that in fact you're learning and adapting with, and you're growing from that um, to losing control. And it's losing control, not just psychologically, but losing physiologic control that begins to then increase stress-related risk for, um, for um, illnesses, various illnesses. And in fact, when it's positive and it's manageable, we've already talked about this, you have your prefrontal executive and attention networks working well, you have good short-term memory, good attention and self-regulation, your cap is functioning well, it's gonna take care of the problem, you're planning and problem solving, you've got good reasoning, flexibility, regulating emotions, um, but slowly with increasing levels of stress, now it's becoming uncontrollable, um, you s your brain starts to change. And you go from being in control, high yellow red regions in the prefrontal cortex, staying on par, managing things, to turning blue, meaning deactivated. And as that starts to happen, you start to have decreased control in the prefrontal cortex over activation of the fist right there. And you start to have mind going blank. How many people have experienced that? Your mind went blank. You forgot something, forgot where you parked your car, right? A lot of little things like that. These are signals that are happening. Decreased concentration and focus, increased distractibility, not being able to really get with it and stay focused. Disorganized impulsive behavior based on immediate needs, taking care of yourself, moving from goal-directed to habit-based, narrow rigid thinking, tunnel vision, perseverative thinking, increased cravings, increased habits, heightened emotionality, social withdrawal. These are all the things that can happen. I'm not saying that all will happen to you at the same time with the same stressor. 
But these are the kinds of symptoms that people will often talk about under when they're under high levels of stress. And we'll come back to that uh, idea of symptoms and signals. OK, how can we reverse the pattern? A lot of times around this time in a talk, people are thinking, oh my goodness, I have felt a lot of these things. Am I doomed? Can I reverse this? Um, and so I want to start right there, even though towards the end of the talk, we'll talk a lot more about um, turning this around and reversal, which is, which is a, a new thing. Let's talk a little bit about, can we change high emotional reactivity? Can we get that fist down a little bit? And what do you do to bring back the cap? Can we begin to do that? So we're going to do an exercise. Everybody ready for a little exercise? OK, excellent. Put both feet on the floor. Get really comfortable in your chair both hands on your lap. And I like to tell people to close their eyes. If you're uncomfortable closing your eyes, just bring your gaze down to the floor so that you basically can cut down on any visual stimulation and turn inwards. And the goal is really to increase attention through observing. How many people have done mindfulness? in the room. A lot of people. Very good. So we'll have people who will connect to this really well. Essentially, we're doing a observing and mindfulness exercise. What I'd like you to do is focus on your breath. All you want to do is notice the air going in through your nostrils. Notice the sensations and what it feels like as the air goes in. Feel the expansion of your chest. And then as it contracts, and the exhale, and the air going out of your nostrils. You're just observing your breath, natural breathing in and out. But you're directing your attention to your breath and noticing the sensations that come up, noticing any feelings or thoughts that may come up. Breath in and out. As you're sitting there, noticing your breath in and out, I want you to focus your mind on the sounds that you hear. Attend to sounds. Notice any sound inside of you or outside. Any sensations you have as you notice the sounds? Any feelings? Any thoughts? Just focus in on the sounds. If your mind wanders away, just gently bring it back to your breath and noticing the sounds.
slowly bring your attention back to the room and open your eyes. Perhaps you notice some sensations. Maybe your mind wandered and you noticed some thoughts and feelings or you had thoughts about the exercise. Hopefully you noticed that. You took a moment and focused inward and noticed your breath. Perhaps you had some urges, urge to move, urge to act, swallow, move your legs. All that would be under the category of urges and actions. Perhaps you had some feelings. In the interest of time, we'll move quickly through this, but if anybody wants to be bold and say what, how, you, how that felt, we did it very briefly. Normally, I would do this for at least five minutes, if not longer. Anybody had any, got right into it? Any thoughts, feelings you want to share? Yes? Um, it was very comfortable. It was, it was nice. It was I, nice. I enjoyed it, yes. Excellent. So you actually felt a change. It, it made you calmer, made you more comfortable? Mm. comfortable? Yes, it did, it did, yeah. Excellent. And not everybody will have that. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's just your answer. It's your experience. And it may not have been comfortable. You might have had a thought about, this is silly, why am I doing this? Or people have often said, your voice was irritating, you kept speaking, <laughs> and that's okay. That's part of the experience. We want you to notice things that are coming at you. How many people were thinking about the stress that I was talking about, or your brain shrinking, or losing neurons? <laughs> no, right? We actually moved away, and you didn't have to go see somebody, not to put down our profession, but really you were right with yourself, observing your breath, focusing on sounds, and coming, doing a pause and a reset. Okay, so it's too bad that we don't do that more often and instead we have plenty in the world to distract ourselves and to engage with. Things that are rewarding, things that give us a more energy and uh, pleasure, and things that can then become habitual, right? So reward is a very um, basic way in which we seek out um, positive reinforcement, but we also learn and adapt to the world. Unfortunately, habits can develop as a function of, of engaging in those rewarding behaviors, and I'm going to cut through a lot of uh, talking about reward right to something like binge drinking. And what you see here on this slide is a, a slide uh, work by Locke and colleagues who looked at uh, the um, serotonin transporter genotype and its association with binge drinking in young adults who were followed. This is a longitudinal data set. And so this is future drinking. Children, uh, and they measured their li life events over uh, their period. And what I, the main purpose of what I wanted to show you, yes, there's an impact of different um, polymorphisms of the serotonin transporter. But the main effect here is dramatic, and the main effect here is of stress. High stress is associated with greater binge drinking, right? And indeed, we find in our data set that smokers report greater stressors. This is, again, this is cumulative stress, which I've introduced to you before on the y-axis. On the x-axis are categories of people, and so these are odds ratios. And high stress is associated with greater alcohol intake, binge drinking, as well as dependence. And stress influences eating behavior. And I've chosen to talk uh, for very briefly about uh, our work on eating and motivation to eat highly palatable foods. Now, we know that stress affects eating behavior, and it's fascinating. In about a third, or about 40%, the data show will increase eating under stress. Another 40% will decrease eating. So both can happen. And if you study eating disorders, in fact, in psychiatric illnesses, we have binge eating, we have overeating, we have anorexia nervosa, sort of extremes of that. And about 20% that don't change as a function of uh, stress in terms of their eating. And in fact, there are neurochemical pathways that are, that are implicated in, in increasing consumption of foods and, and also in decreasing consumptions of food. 
And here are our reward pathways. In the middle here of this circuitry, again, your brain with the fist and the cap, the prefrontal cortex uh, in the cap that is regulating things. But NAC is your reward uh, um, center, one of the reward centers, as is the VTA. And that's traditionally VTA, NAC, and the PFC is traditionally your reward circuit. But indeed, we know now from a lot of very good basic science and neuroimaging studies that additional regions, like the emotional regions, amygdala, like the memory regions, uh, hippocampus, and the hypothalamus, and other regions are involved in us experiencing reward and regulating reward. But I want to focus in on dopamine, because it's one of the most uh, well-known neurochemicals. Everybody says, oh, dopamine is your pleasure chemical. Well, dopamine is does respond to reward. It's also your instrumental action chemical. It's the one that goes up when you actually do have to uh, act and, and save yourself in, in stressful si situations. What's really interesting when you think about food is that, in fact, medications uh, that inhibit D2 receptors or dopamine receptors, like antipsychotics, some of you may be familiar with that, they are known to increase appetite and weight gain. And medications that block the reuptake of dopamine and drugs that do that, like cocaine and amphetamine, have, are well known to, in fact, have an impact on decreasing weight. So your, your dopaminergic system is directly linked in many ways to uh, motivating us uh, for uh, food and um, uh, eating. And indeed, the, po the point I want to make here is Here's your stress and motivation circuitry. Really highly overlapping. Most regions are exactly the same. Threat will activate these regions. Stress, metabolic hormones, the hormones that are processing food and involved in satiety and hunger are signaling to the brain. And in fact, the stress circuitry involves, of course, cortisol and ACTH, the stress hormones, but also the chemical that gets it all going, the corticosterone releasing factor, the norepinephrine signaling, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and these are some of the signals involved in coordinating the stress pathways. So I just wanted to put that in context that, in fact, our reward pathways overlap significantly with the stress pathway. And we did a study with our endocrine colleagues in collaboration where we had people uh, consume a um, standard dose of glucose, a glucose drink, 75 milligrams of glucose. And I'm going to just show you the study uh, findings. The, the paper is published. And what happens with when you consume glucose is that, in fact, the hypothalamus right there in the middle in HYP um, goes down. You've just fed the hypothalamus. It's not acting, it's not asking for more food. It says it's good, it's fine. These are lean individuals. And then in conjunction with the hypothalamus, the reward pathways, those additional blue blobs and some emotional regions are also going down. So glucose has just gone into your body and the brain is feeling okay, it's feeling happy. And you see with higher levels of glucose, you have the hypothalamus beautifully going down in activity. And when you see this region and say, what other, place, other parts of the brain is the hypothalamus connected to? This is a feeding center, right? Um, in fact, it's connected to, to the thalamus, but more importantly, the point of the, of the slide below or the strip of images below, and the yellow red shows what else it's connected to. The hypothalamus is directly connected to the reward pathways the caudate, putamen, the striatum, those are those other regions that are marked there, all again in the fist. And the hypothalamus is sending message to the reward pathway, we're good, we have glucose on board, everything's good, we don't need any more. All right? This is a second study that we did where we wanted to actually manipulate glucose. And with using the hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is an endocrine procedure, that my endocrine colleagues have perfected and do very well. We actually did this in the scanner. And what we did was we did a controlled study where every individual was either maintained in a euglycemic phase where your blood glucose levels were around 90, and then they were dropped to around 68. This is mild hypoglycemia. There was no um, clinical uh, hypoglycemic symptoms, okay? So actually, over the course of the day, our blood glucose levels go up and down. And they can go down, if you haven't eaten for six to seven hours, maybe it'll go down to 68. 
and 70s. This is really very mild levels, but enough for the brain, we hypothesize, to pick up that things are going down. And in fact, um, what I would like to show you before I get to the task, which has just appeared, is that cortisol levels on, the, on your right, the little graph that shows up there, U here means euglycemia when your glucose levels were normal, and hypo means when they were dropped. And in fact, as they went down there in the black bar, you see that cortisol levels went up. So you start to have signaling in the body. This is a physiologic stressor, and the body is starting say, to say, OK, something's up. Glucose levels are down. We need to do something. And we were very interested, given my interest in reward and in addiction, we were interested in how is the brain responding in the motivational pathways in terms of food preference and wanting and liking. And so we showed them during both of these periods of euglycemia and hypoglycemia, we showed them pictures of ice cream cones, brownies, cake, um, chocolate chip cookies, pizza, chicken wings, broccoli, tofu, <laughs> carrots, and some chairs and tables and lamps. And these are all interspersed together. And what we wanted to know is how much did they want, how much did they like each of those items, and how much did they want them, OK? And so in a nutshell, here's the data. What you see in the bottom strip there um, are the brain images, and the fist is everything in the middle, OK? And when it says blue there, it's the contrast of under hypoglycemia when your blood glucose was low, the fist was hyperactive. Okay, that's what it's showing in blue down there. Insula, hypoth hypothalamus, striatum is all going up. What's in red is your prefrontal cortex. That goes down when your glucose levels are low. You don't want to be thinking. You don't want to be saying, well, I don't want to eat. The body, the brain is wired to s help you survive, and it's it's um, bringing off thinking, offline for thinking, and, and, um, and regulating, and in fact, motivating your uh, reward regions to, to act. But what was it motivating for? It was actually wanting, preferentially wanting, the high calorie foods. So chocolate chip cookies and, and cake was looking a lot more appealing. You wanted them more. Your wanting ratings went up higher. You weren't, didn't want broccoli and tofu, even though they were prepared well. Uh, those images were not uh, being endorsed. We clearly wanted that in the uh, hypoglycemic state. And this, these were the brain regions that were, that were pushing those. And in fact, what you see here is that here's the prefrontal ventromedial prefrontal cortex. When glucose levels are down, the prefrontal cortex is lower. When they're higher, it's back up. And the plasma cortisol levels, when they are high, which they were in hypoglycemia, you had higher um, um, reactivity in those regions in the fist. So physiologic stress. We're not talking about what one stressor versus another stress. Physiologic stress that is having this response where the cap starts to droop and the fist is up because we, in fact, need to take care of our bodies and we need to get some food in. And at that point, you want high calorie foods. You want foods that are going to get processed quickly and bring glucose levels back up. So hopefully, I've shown you data of what the process in the brain is that might lead to uh, increasing frequency and consumption of these um, high, high calorie foods and fast food snacks and highly palatable foods. Um, just, to, just to have a pointer, very quick pointer, again, this is a published paper, but once again, that same region of the brain in the cap, which is the ventromedial PFC, is dysregulated in recovering alcoholics, and that predicts future uh, drinking days, future relapse and future drinking days. So again, a hot spot in the same region. Where I'm headed is that we're starting to identify some biomarkers in the brain. Um, around this. So who is most susceptible to stress? There are measurement challenges. Cumulative stressful life events can be measured, just like I showed you. You can ask people how stressed they are, which is the perceived stress questionnaire. You can measure early life stress. But what about stress symptoms? What about going beyond one stress is worse than the other, but really asking you, where are you feeling it in your body? What are your stress signals? And if you're having some symptoms, then perhaps that's where we can begin to intervene to think about uh, prevention. So are there stress symptoms? And this is something that on our uh, Stress Center website we have. We give it to our patients. We say, you know what? 
I'm often asked, people will say, well, how do I know if I'm losing any neurons in my frontal cortex, in my cap? They say, well, I could scan you, but you know, we don't have that as a diagnostic test in psychiatry yet. I would like that to be there, but we don't have it yet. In the meantime, take this sheet and circle what you're feeling. If you have three or four or more of these, your body is sending you a signal. It's telling you you have stress symptoms. You have some signs, right? And so we can have cognitive symptoms of stress and uh, emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms, and physical symptoms. And in fact, there are individual differences. We come back to where you feel the stressor and where you feel your emotion. If I asked you right now and I took a sample and said, where do you feel? When you get stressed out, where do you feel it? I've had people who say, I feel in my stomach. Immediately, I have a knot in my stomach. Other people say, I hold it in my shoulders. I've got tension in my neck. This is the way stress is affecting, interacting perhaps with genes and, and uh, other um, neurochemical pathways and biological pathways to express or have your pressure points be different. Get to know your pressure points. And in fact, have your patients get to know theirs. And you'll start to see that um, there are these different signs and signals of stress. When we looked at our cumulative adversity load measure right there on the y-axis to your left and looked at stress symptoms, the greater cumulative adversity, greater repeated stressful life events in people's lives, the more stress symptoms they were likely to report. And that's just shown there in both, uh, in both ways. And then, uh, in fact, higher cumulative adversity was associated with greater insulin, morning fasting insulin levels, morning fasting glucose levels, as well as poor, um, poor parasympathetic autonomic reactivity. In the, um, in the gray bars, poor autonomic reactivity is actually lower here for parasympathetic activity. And um, so you see a response in your autonomic nervous system as a function of high cumulative load. High cumulative load was also associated with weight, gain, with weight uh, body mass index, as well as blood pressure. Again, not new in terms of data, but really connecting it to load and cumulative load that we can begin to operationalize load and then see its impact on the body and the mind. And so when stress is overwhelming, you lose control over mind, body, and behaviors. And really, the new and exciting work in stress, as you think about this, is what's happening in the brain. The first target of stress really is in the brain. You start to lose things. It's, it's very dynamic. Things are changing. And it's trying to regain control. And of course, it's having, oops, it's having other effects um, in, in your lungs and heart and stomach and inflammation. But most importantly, it's, have, it's either giving you things to do or telling you what, how to cope with stress or having you go to habits and other th kinds of things. And so that's really important. So our task at the Stress Center, if, if uh, my goal at the Stress Center is to see how we can reverse these changes, that's one aspect of what we do. We'd like to bring back the cap. We want to make it last longer so that it can coordinate and control and regulate the rest of the brain. And we want to calm down the reactivity. In a nutshell, that's the challenge. That's, those would be the treatments if we, or interventions that we want to start to focus on. There's some very interesting work going on in uh, neurobiology at Yale and other places where they're looking at prefrontal cortical neurons and seeing, can we save them? Can we reverse them? And here are a couple of medications, existing medications out there that are related to, uh, that are antihypertensive, some of them not being used anymore, prazosin and guamfacine. I'll show you very quickly some data. This is work by Amy Arnston, who has pulled together a beautiful molecular pathway by which she has shown that, in fact, stress is destroying or uh, leading to stress-related prefrontal impairment as a function of cyclic AMP and PKC signaling pathways. If you're a basic scientist, you'll understand this. And noradrenergic agents, like the ones I'm going to tell you about in a minute, are ones that can begin to reverse these. So we can perhaps develop medications that are targeting stress-related atrophy and stress-related impairment that can be used, of course, in illnesses that are related, um, that are stress-related illnesses like PTSD and depression, but perhaps also under chronic stress before somebody gets um, that illness. So prazosin is an old antihypertensive drug. It rescues repeated stress-related impairment in the prefrontal cortex, improves working memory under stress, 
decreases PTSD symptoms. And these are data that I'll just show you very quickly from um, Murray Raskin's lab, where in the pink bar is post-treatment um, uh, with prazosin versus placebo. And you see a decrease in improvement in sleep ratings and nightmares, as well as uh, you see um, in our hands, this is a small study that's published where we see a reduction in stress-induced craving for alcohol among alcoholics and a reduction in anxiety under prazosin and improvement in, um, in um, uh, positive emotion, which is not shown here, but, but more decrease in negative emotion. And then this is guanfacine, which is intunib. I don't know if intunib is available here for in the treatment of ADHD in, in Sweden. Shire Pharmaceuticals has put out an extended release of intunib, which is an alpha-2 uh, adrenergic agonist, guanfacine, improves prefrontal activation. The data you're being shown here is really the uh, yellow red blobs where under stress, in this case a cognitive stressor, like the Stroop task, guanfacine versus placebo improved activation in the prefrontal cortex. So I was showing you blue blobs where the prefrontal cortex is drooping down. You give guanfacine and it's coming back up. Okay, so that was interesting. But there are behavioral strategies as well. We did one very briefly just to get you all a little distanced from the prefrontal neuron um, damage idea. Um, but these are ones we are doing quite a bit at the stress center. Uh, breath and relaxation training, breath and movement training, meditation, exercise, mindfulness-based meditation, um, as well as stress reduction, which I know that many of you are practicing, and traditional cognitive therapies, um, as well as building in the practice of these types of uh, stress-reducing activities in your daily life as a preventative um, to stressors. So very quickly, I don't think this is an audience I have to define mindfulness for. It looks like many of you do this. But I want to underscore one point about mindfulness, which is that it has come into the um, mainstream media. People are talking about it. And there's a lot of perceptions about what it may be. And so really, the, as in, being in the mental health field, I'd like to underscore the fact that there's an attitude component about mindfulness, which is observing and putting your attention to something, being open-minded. Those are just attitudes. The key thing here with mindfulness is the discipl discipline of practice. And that's where it's hard to do this every day. When I'm training, I ask people to do this first thing in the morning for five minutes. Take five minutes to do a few mindfulness exercises. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night. How many of you do this daily? Some of you do, which is great. Do you find the benefit of it? Doing well, that? I've been doing it for 10 years, yeah. Excellent. It's, it's great. Excellent. So training and practice, the plug of this slide really is that training and practice is key uh, to mindfulness-based therapies. And so I just want all of us in the mental health field to go out there and be the proponents of, there's one thing about being mindful when you're attending to uh, anything that's stressful. It's a whole other thing to be practicing it and doing it every day and strengthening your own um, um, observing skills. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. And did you want to do another exercise or shall we? Yes? OK. It is a pretty full room. Perhaps everybody could stand up. Your legs, your legs apart, uh, about one foot apart, just a little bit. Check in with your body. Get really comfortable inside, shoulders back, and into your back. Eyes focused on the floor or closed. And I want you to slowly, and maybe somebody next to you, just avoid them, but slowly start to move your arms up as you breathe in. Just moving your arms up. See if you can do that sideways. And you're going to take it slowly up, breathing in and out. Just hold your arms up towards the sky in open position. Breathing in and out. 
And as you stand there with your arms up, reaching for the sky, I want you to notice the sensations you're feeling in your body. Any urges, any feelings and sensations, any thoughts. If anything hurts, if you have too much pain, please put your hands down. Be the judge of your own pain and what you can tolerate. But keep it up there and notice where you're feeling that movement. Breath in and out. In and out. notice the sensations, the thoughts, the feelings. Slowly bringing your arms down, all the way down, flipping them over to your sides, and breath out. Open your eyes. Please have a seat. That was quick. I usually like to keep that going for a little while. You can also take that through, up, and going forward all the way down as much as you can. If you can't bend too much, you can bend your knees, but go all the way down, lowering your head, relaxing your neck, noticing the sensations, the muscles. How many people noticed some muscles you hadn't thought about for a little while? <laughs> right? You immediately. Those are signals your body is telling you okay, there's pain here, there's a shift there, you're noticing this. Again, grounding yourself in your body, away from those things that are bothering you that may be taking up your energy. Moving into your body, into your breath, can uh, begin to reset. So very quickly, mindfulness-based therapies, you all know this work by John Teasdale and, and Zindel Siegel. Very nicely controlled treatment trials showing that uh, depression a relapse is, uh, is attenuated, the recurrence of relapse is attenuated as a function of mindfulness-based um, cognitive therapy. This is well known now in the literature. Um, these are data expert meditators showing change in their, in their brain response um, to meditation compared to novices, a lot in the prefrontal cortex, but also in the, in the fist regions of the brain. And these are our data where we looked at smokers who were randomly assigned to either a psychoeducational uh, freedom from smoking or mindfulness-based therapy led by Judson Brewer. And um, we then compared their response to stress. So this is a stress response. And what's in blue shows deactivation, meaning lower response. So I've been showing you high response under stress in the fist regions, which are right there in blue. Whoops. And um, in fact, what we see here that under stress, the mindfulness trained um, patients were uh, showing lower reactivity in the amygdala and the uh, insula. And then the amygdala reactivity was correlating and predicting those who were successful in, um, in abstaining from cigarettes. These were nicotine dependent individuals. So again, some uh, bringing the imaging data and seeing whether interventions, in this case behavioral interventions, can, can mediate a good treatment response um, was the point of these data. They're new, and I just wanted to share that with you. With that, I want to leave you with our Stress Center Clinical Services. It's a place that's an interdisciplinary center where we have uh, cl clinical specialists from different uh, disciplines as well as uh, translational scientists working to see if we can uh, improve wellness and health for everybody. Either you may have a psychiatric illness or a physical, chronic uh, physical illness, or you may be worried about being really stressed. The point is that you can begin 
to notice your signs and symptoms and start to turn that around to optimize your function and your well-being. And we can use any of and all of these types of therapies after a more comprehensive evaluation. Um, and with that, I want to leave you with our website uh, information and our slide. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.